discrete event simulation is the structuring of the simulation problem in such a way that it changes at discrete instances in time in response to discrete events. And if any of you took a simulation course in college, this is probably what they focused on. Most simulation textbooks focus on the structure, the creation, and the tools necessary to build discrete event simulations. Now there are really three different categories of simulation according to that school of thought. The first is that there are discrete event simulations where you have the state of a system and that state only changes when an event arrives from some outside source. And that event arrives at a discrete point in time and is a discrete event which changes the system. The second way of doing it is by defining differential equations which give a continuous value for a bunch of state variables based on time or based on the state of the system. So you may look at the state at a discrete point in time, but it doesn't change discreetly. It changes continuously according to a di differential equation. And then the third one is Monte Carlo simulation, where you're using random numbers to make a decision in a simulation, and the state may change randomly based on a random number draw. And then, of course, if you include two or more of these in any system, they call it a hybrid system. In 1976, Bernard Ziegler wrote a textbook in which he defined a formal definition for discrete event system specification. And he really helped out a lot if you were asking the question, what is a discrete event simulation? What's in one? How does it work? Well, he helped out quite a bit in describing that. And I'm going to show you on the next slide the fundamental components that are listed here and how they work together. The first component is the model itself you define a boundary which defines what is inside your simulation and what is outside. It's essentially the shell or the box into which you're going to put the rest of your simulation. Inside of there you put a bunch of state variables. You decide what are the attributes of the objects that you're going to be modeling in this simulation. And in a military example that object might have position, he might have fuel levels, uh, different sizes, the weapons, uh, his perception of the outside world, health, strength, plans that he's going to execute in the future. Could be anything in his state set. But he has a formal state set that describes his attributes at some point in time. Controlling changes to that state, state set and changes to the model itself is some time advance algorithm. And the most practical thing that this time advance algorithm does is it orders input events. When you receive an external input event, the time advance function will decide for you what order those events should be executed. Which ones go first, which ones go second, third, etc. So it'll order up events so that they are causally correct. Now an event might enter the system from another source. It might be from an initialization file. It might be from another simulator. It might be from another model in this same simulator. When it enters, uh, an event like an explode event will hit something called an external transition function. The external transition function understands the explode event. If you look at that state set, there's nothing about the states in that state set that give you a clue as to what the relationship is between an explode event and those different state variables. Well, the external transition function is that mapping. The external transition function understands an explode event. It understands that the range between the explosion and your object is important. That the propagation of the blast force goes in a certain pattern. That the propagation may be interrupted by the terrain or, or by trees or other vehicles. It goes through all the calculations that say, I know what this explosion does and what it's going to mean to the model that I'm working in right now. As soon as it's calculated the effects of that explosion, it's essentially translated explode into something that's meaningful to the state set. And it hands that meaning over to the internal transition functions. And the internal transition functions are responsible for changing the values of the state. They're the ones that say, oh, I didn't understand what an explode meant, but I do know what it means when you tell me to change my position, to change my health, to change my size. I know where those state variables are located and I will change them. So the internal transition function makes a state change. When the, both of these happen, this external transition or the internal transition, 
there's a thing known as an output event generator. When you change the state of this model or when a specific event happens to this model, it may be necessary that information be propagated to another model. And the output event generators look at what's happening inside this model, changes to state, calculations by the functions, and decide if something has occurred here which needs to be packaged up and sent to another model. So the output event generators recognize when that significant change has happened and they trigger output events or they create output events. The output events might be change my appearance. An explosion came in, blew the turret off of a tank, I need to change, send information out that changes my appearance so that everybody else can see it. Or I need to change out uh, my location so that people see me at a new location. So those output events then go out and they go to the next model and they become the external input events for some other model. When you add up all of those variables, they become what's called a seven tuple. And you might say, what is a seven tuple? I never heard of that. Well, if somebody called you up and said, Harry, I'm at the corner of first and main, he just gave you a two tuple. It's just a set of coordinates that mean something when they're grouped together. X, Y, Z coordinates and time. That's a four tuple with the time on it. And a seven tuple just means to define this model you need seven different variables or seven different components. And that's what Bernard Ziegler defined in his 1976 book. Now when you describe a discrete event model by those seven different components you haven't described everything about the model. You can structure those in different ways and the modeling structures that are widely accepted are three. The first being event scheduling where events arrive from some outside source and they get queued up in a master event queue of some kind. And then the simulation engine spends its time going to the event queue, taking off the most current or the event that needs to be executed right now and then taking it to the object or the model or the function that needs to execute that event and giving it to that model, having it executed and then it goes back and gets the next event. So it's based or focused on an event queue. That's what event scheduling is. The second way of structuring it is called activity scanning. In activity scanning, the simulation engine receives these events but it doesn't queue them up. Instead, it takes them immediately to the object or function that's supposed to handle them and gives them to those objects and says, here, this is your problem. You hold on to it. Doesn't execute it yet. As these come in, it gives them to the objects and then his execution phase is to run through a list of the objects or functions that need to operate and say, do you have any events that need to be executed right now? If so, execute them. And that object may execute 10 different events because he's holding 10 that are valid right now. Goes to the next object, runs those. Next object, runs those. Next object, runs those. And so the focus on where the events get executed is different and how they get held is different. And then the last one is process interaction. In process interaction, the simulation might take control of an object and execute all of the events in its event queue without regard for what's in another object. And so you take that object and you start executing it forward and you execute forward until either one, you run out of events, or two, you run into a situation where you say, I can't execute this event without interacting with another object. In which case you put that object down and you go and get another object and execute him along until you reach the point that those two can interact. And so you bring them all up as they are able to interact with each other. But your objective is to push each object as far forward in time or as far forward in its event queue as you can. That's the three basic ways of looking at or structuring a discrete event simulation. I mentioned that Stanislaw Ulam invented the idea of Monte Carlo simulation. Well, since he's done that, random number generation and the effects of random numbers have totally permeated the discrete event simulation community. Any discrete event simulation or any tool that you buy will have lots of logic to generate fair random numbers. Now, strictly, a random number is a number that is fairly distributed between zero and one. And a random number generator if you ask it to generate you a stream of 100 numbers, those numbers will be distributed fairly in that range. If you ask for 1 million, they will still be fair in that range. You won't see spikes. You won't see that it's unfairly assigning numbers in the range 
uh, 0.2 to 0.3 and much fewer in 0.7 to 0.8, a good random number generator. Good random number generators are not random at all. They are very deterministic. They are mathematical algorithms. In fact, the most popular form is there on the screen. A good random number generator is mathematic and the way it works causes it to fairly generate these and the numbers appear to be random. These mathematical algorithms are better random number generators than doing tricky things that to the initial human eye say, that's a good random number generator. For example, you've probably seen people looking to create random numbers that said, what I'm going to do is sample the system clock of the computer and read off the 32nd and 42nd bit and 42nd digits and combine those and say that's my random number between 0 and 100. That is a bad way of generating random numbers. If you generate a sequence of a million of those, you will find out that it does spike in certain areas and that there are some numbers that never get represented. Those are bad ra random number generators. Well, what do you do with a random number? In some cases, you want a number distributed evenly, fairly, uniformly between 0 and 1. In other cases, you don't want that. What you want is random variates. Random variates are numbers drawn from statistical distributions like normal distributions or uh, uh, Weibull distributions, gamma distributions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there are three ways of doing that. There's the inverse transform method, which I'm going to show you here because you'll understand it in one slide. You'll go, I get it. There's also the acceptance rejection method but you can read the reference sources if you have to know that one. And you can read the composition method if you want. The inverse transform method looks at a distribution and says, just a minute, I need to fairly select a number that is distributed according to this Weibull density function. Well, I know that if I generate a million of those, I should get a whole bunch of numbers between 0 and 5. Much fewer between 5 and 10 and still fewer between 10 and 15. Now, how can I construct an algorithm that can do that? You can construct algorithms that do that. But that algorithm will have to be validated, and it will be valid only for the Weibull density function. Some clever people said, just a minute. Do you know if you take the cumulative distribution function of any distribution, a Weibull in this case, that it accumulates starting at 0 and asymptotes at 1? Hmm, you know what that tells me? What if I used my uniform random number generator to fairly generate a number between 0 and 1 and then backtrace that through the function to arrive at my x draw? Wouldn't that fairly give me numbers that were distributed according to the Weibull distribution? Yes, it would. You know the other thing it will do? It requires you to only come up with one way of generating random numbers. You only have to validate your function that generates fair uniform random numbers. And if you just do the mathematics right to invert this function, you will get the correct numbers for normal distributions and Weibull distributions and exponential distributions. Very clever. If you're worried that you're going to build a simulation that requires you to write statistical distributions or to write the software that knows how to, to select random numbers, then you want to know about simulation specific languages, which we'll get to in a minute. But the statistical distributions that are useful for particular situations have been shaken out through hundreds of different people researching this area, doing studies and finding out what the distributions are for data in specific situations. They know, for example, that if you want to know what is the inner arrival time between customers arriving in a barber shop, that that number is distributed exponentially. They know that the time it takes a, somebody at a target to serve a customer is distributed with a gamma distribution. All you have to do is go and get a statistical cookbook or to get a simulation book and they will tell you when these different distributions are useful and then you can customize them a little bit. But they'll give you a big leg up rather than causing you to be the original research scientist who discovers the distribution that's appropriate for each one of your models.